Okay, we should be live. We give it just a couple yeah, seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Are you seeing it on here? All right. Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, hello. Uh, welcome to another um, live stream. Uh, this week, instead of being at the HQ like we've been for the last couple of weeks, we're down at our fabrication shop, which we call the TT. Uh, we can get into that. Uh, and today we got Charlie here, uh, Grant, we got Jay, uh, and our new uh, assembly hand, Dennis. Hello. <laughs> and we'll probably do is something similar to what we've done up at HQ and kind of start with the raw material and follow it through to the finished product. And also just kind of give you an overall tour around where we store stuff uh, and kind of the processes we use down here. So it's going to be a fun, um, different podcast. Charlie, you want to start off with a little, uh, should we walk right through the raw material? Yeah, sure. Let's go through that. So uh, one thing um, I'll mention first is, please, uh, if you have questions, you can either ask those on, like, on if you're on YouTube, or some, we're broadcasting to both YouTube and Facebook. Post those comments up, and we will get to them. Uh, we'll take breaks every once in a while to answer the questions. And, um, so post up any questions you have. For some context, we're like three quarters of a mile from HQ right now, still in downtown Goshen. Mm -hmm. And this shop we opened in March of last year, is that right? Or is it two years? No, two years. It's been a year and a half. Yeah, it's been a year and a half. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, and so this <clears throat> this room uh, we renovated. Brent does our fenders. Really was instrumental in that. And started off with one person, and we've kind of gradually been building down here. Um, and making it more and more iron. So let's go walk through some of the 450. Okay. Nice. Uh, a little more uh, context. The, as many of you know, our 250 chassis are made and have been made since the 50cc days out in um, what we call the inner world by an Amish shop out near Napanee, Indiana, about 20 minutes from here. And they have made those for many years, as I say, uh, they still continue to make them. But when we launched the 450 line, one of the goals of that, you know, hand in hand with the new product was going to be bringing that fabrication in house. So what you're seeing here is 450 chassis uh, fabrication and um, also fender production. Uh, the fender production is, is for the 450 and 250 as well. Uh, we have some nice videos on the Fender uh, production, so if you, um, we'll probably post a, a link to that as well. But um, that's Brent on the on the uh, on the pull max. So. Yeah. Go ahead, John. So since this is our fab shop, is mostly in this room, but since we have so much space down here, we also use this for storage for all the stuff that we don't want to keep it <laughs> at HQ. So not only do we keep our raw materials for the fab shop here. Keep lots of other stuff like tires and engines and wheels and all the big stuff that we don't want to <laughs> have to be tripping over at HQ. So when we talk about up at HQ, the where we have our supermarket in the back of the shop, if you've seen one of those um, uh, videos, live streams, uh, these are the parts that we don't keep in at HQ. The larger parts that we bring in on a weekly basis. So that milk van, that milk route, stops here, picks up chassis components to go out to powder and everything. Etc. But it'll also pick up enough tires or engines for the following week. Yeah, let's walk back. You can look at where the 450 engines are. So if you if you order a bike sometime, probably in the next like two months from now, one of these engines goes in your bike. Those are 450 engines all over here. Richard, you should talk to the big system. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And in front here, this is, uh, this is part of the process of how things work. But this is <clears throat> for fenders. So these bins are our uh, kind of purchasing system for fenders. So Brent, when he's, uh, um, well, basically a fender bin will show up back here when it's been used at the show, at the at HQ. When Kelly has finished pinstriping it and it goes on a bike, then there's an empty bin, and that bin gets dropped off down here on the milk route. 
And when that bin shows up in the shop, that is the cue for Brent to fill it with more fenders. So uh, as you can see, these are way, these are uh, fenders that Brent will be building in the coming couple of days. Um, and then once those once he's got those full, they'll sit and wait for the milk root, the milkman to pick them up, and they go out to powder coat, come back to the shop, get pinstriped, go on a bike, and that empty bin shows up right back down here. So it's a neat system that kind of uh, it, it's self uh, is it self perpetuating. <laughs> as long as yeah. uh, as long as there are bikes to build, there's empty bins to fill. It doesn't take any thinking. If there's an empty bin, you put a fender in it, and that's. Uh... <laughs> So here's a lot of our raw material that we use in the fab shop. So we get all this stuff laser cut from Southwest Welding, one of our vendors. So this is a down tube for a 450. This is your, uh, your head tubes right here for steering and uh, your engine bolts onto here. So we get all these parts cut out. So all that needs to happen is for them to go right into the welding gig and be done. Here is a frame rail for the main frame. So you see they do all of our uh, all of our coping for the ends of that tubing and they put they put etch marks in for our bending that we can line up the bender right on those marks and get the tubes bent without having to measure anything. This is all DOM tubing that we use for the frames of the 450. You can see that we got a stack of what, what are these? Oh, these are those are rails. These are left rails. cradle. So these are the top rail, the left side. We got the right side, <laughs> bottom. We have fork legs. There's just a stack for each specific part. And you, when you're ready to make that part, you just pull that part, put it in the bender. We'll show you next, and um, go from there. And we just make sure we have enough of these on hand to uh, keep us moving. I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, uh, what does the welding raccoon decal on the seat pin represent? <laughs> what is the only decal that kept on the bike? Then you, you can uh, rephrase the question. Yeah, so the question was, we got a couple questions. Um, a customer asked about the welding raccoon on their seat. He said it was the only sticker he left on his on his bike. Um, the, can go find one? <laughs> we do have some around here, but the welding raccoon is a, a little tribute to our Amish um, fabrication shop. Uh, it's great. Um, Hawk Ryder wants to know, could the 450 frame theoretically accommodate a transplant from, say, a Yamaha or Triumph 650 to 750 parallel twin? That or maybe a small jet engine. Probably <laughs> manage to fit in there. Rephrase the questions for me. Yeah. Pulse jet. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question is, could you put a larger <laughs> engine from a Triumph or maybe a Hayabusa in a 450 frame? And yeah, you could probably fit a jet engine or whatever you want. Um, we don't recommend it. <laughs> I think that voids your warranty also. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, not right now. No, great. Folks are giving some uh, advice to Tim, who has a 450 on order about insurance. And mm. uh, uh, Tim, uh, I'm happy to answer some questions over email, too. So You want to say that on closer to Richard? Like yes. like. so Tim, a, I'll answer some email, uh, uh, some insurance questions over email for you. All right. All right. So let's keep moving. So we've also got a few questions on Facebook oh, as well. Yep. Oh, yeah, we can do it first. Um, Jim has asked, what bike shops can perform maintenance? So the question was, what bike shops can perform maintenance? Right, Charlie? Uh, <laughs> we have a network of shops that we already work with um, in a lot of places, most uh, major locations around the states. If you, if there's nowhere near you that we have experience working with, we can give local shops a call, and, and we have a lot of luck with that. Um, typically, the kind of shops that we work with are going to be your mom and pop kind of uh, small um, local hometown shops that will work on older bikes, Japanese bikes, metric bikes, etc. cetera. Um, so just give us a call, basically, and we can get you set up. Um, and then one more here from uh, William. How long does it take to normally to build one? From start to finish, how long does it take to build, let's say, a, um, a four fifty? Yeah. yeah. The frame? Yeah. Let's let's talk about like a chassis component first. Jay, um, how long does it take to make a four fifty frame? <laughs> uh, generally, from 
uh, assembly to final welded about a day, day and a half. Um, and then whatever turnaround would be for uh, we, we, uh, we sandblast and for sandblast and a week for powder, mm -hmm. a week for sandblast and a week for powder. So two weeks after it will show up at HQ and then uh, one of our guys will put it together at that point. And uh, that's just one part in the life cycle of a, of a 450, for example, or, or a 250. There's the collecting the information, getting the parts sent off the powder coat, as we mentioned, um, the, as the parts all come together. So it's a, a lengthy process in total. And, and even like some of the cases like the 250, where it's, we have a, what is our six, six weeks right now? Five weeks. Five you. weeks right now for a 250. Some of those components may already be complete before the order is placed. And so we, because we were able to do that, we can bring the time down. Mm -hmm. Great questions. Any more on Facebook? Um, gentleman asked, uh, just to explain a little more about the uh, engines we use. Okay, sure. Um, so the question was talking about our needs. Sure. 450 engine, I guess we're at the fab shop. So we only do 450 parts here. So if you ask questions, about 450. Yeah, if you ask questions, <laughs> we're gonna answer for a 450 unless you wanna talk about us. <laughs> the 450 engine is a 445 air-cooled four valve overhead cam, five speed Honda XR400 based engine. Done. Manufactured by SWM, <laughs> an Italian company made in China. Um, and just like the 250, what kind of connects it and the reason we chose it is that it's really really simple single cylinder um, does have fuel injection which is something we wanted to go to but it's an engine that has many many years of use it doesn't take a whole lot of specialty tools and um, parts are all over the world about 30 horsepower about 30 horsepower I think that's many more information. <laughs> I think that's everything. <laughs> Hold the video down and go back and watch. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a quick, quick uh, tour of the 250 too. Sure. Well, the, yeah. uh, the 250 engine uh, is a uh, 229 cc single uh, overhead valve, a uh, very, very simple engine developed specifically to be simple and low maintenance. Push rod engine. Push rod. Air cooled. Yep. Has a balancing shaft. So does a 450. Mm -hmm. 14 uh, horsepower. 14 horsepower, um, made in China, and we've been using it for, oh goodness, since 2016, and it's a fantastic bulletproof engine. Mm -hmm. I'd take off on one tomorrow to go to wherever. <laughs> <laughs> It'll outlast the cockroaches. That's well, right. Really yeah. well. <laughs> Do your oil changes and it's fine. So what's the next step in the uh, process? Talk, sure. We've got a couple inspections right here. I think, that oh, I think the, wait, we'll yeah. go through an order. Yeah. Yep. yeah, so that all our raw tubes come in here, and this is kind of the holding area for stuff we don't keep immediately on hand for welding. So the real area where Jay and Dennis pull parts from as they work. <laughs> it needs to be restocked right now, but usually this is where all the tubes are. So when Jay's working on stuff, he's grabbing tubes off of this rack to go into the bender. We keep our machine parts on the floor here so stuff like this this is your head tube for your 450 where your uh where your steering pivots in so we get all machine parts like this and tubes like you uh yeah two couple more neat machine parts this is the steering stem so this is what the fork pivots on little bits like this that go into the bottom of the um, fork legs this is where your your horizontal pivots on zerk fitting So our general flow of parts, you can see actually, we're halfway through the assembly, swing arms and verticals. So we'll grab a great part like this. Grab a great part like this and load it up with parts and take them over to the bender here. And uh, <laughs> we make vent parts, vent tubes out of straight tubes. These are all ready to go in the final assembly jigs to get welded together. So this part right here is your fork, ver fork vertical on your 450. And what it's had done to it so far is it's been bent and it's got a plug welded in the end of it with a threaded threaded hole. So bring that over here. You can see the guys have a, uh, have a fork vertical in the jig right now. 
So this tube is that guy right there. You can see how, and then here's that machine part that Richard was showing you. All this stuff fits in the jig, gets bolted together, and then gets welded up. So it's not all the way welded. Uh, you just can't get at the back sides while it's in the jig, but they'll pull it out, weld the back side, and then there's a couple inspection processes and it, it goes out. So we make here at, at Turtle Top, we make this piece, which is the fork vertical. And then we have the fork horizontal jig right here with one in it. That's a part like that. The second assembly we make, part of the, uh, the leading link suspension that the 450s and the 250s have. Really a neat setup designed for old school manufacturing and has some, some neat advantages like anti-dive. It's really robust, strong. So tell us a little bit more about the tooling here on the, on the table. And yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I can't pull this jig out because or this uh, this <laughs> vertical out because they're using it. But um, we worked with Adam Diaz, a uh, frame builder out of Indy. He's done lots of cool stuff. Uh, really a pro um, to get this tooling set up. Um, so originally we worked with him to get stuff set up, but that torch has kind of passed down to to me and to Jay. Um, as far as modifying and making sure that stuff works. So kind of the big advantage with shifting the 450, our big deal is that everything was done in the computer first as opposed to on the shop floor. And so we can develop tooling and have tooling laser cut and then just stick it together with the, you know, puzzle piece kind of mortise and tenons um, and have a piece of tooling that takes no hand fitting, anything like that, just goes together and it's done. So that that's really a big deal for us. And a big reason why we started this whole fab shop. So we also make the the swing arm for 450 right here. Here's one that's actually complete. completed being inspection. It has its card on there, and it's ready to go to sandblast and powder coat. Here's a finished swing arm. So your rear wheel, rear axle goes through there, rear wheel there, and then your engine's right here. The, the pivot goes through the engine and the swing arm itself. And then here's the last piece we make, which is the mainframe. This one is not all the way done. About all the way done. This would be an example of something that's fresh out of the fixture, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. they weld it all they can. Yeah, so you can see like not all the welds are done. It's stitched together, but it's not all the way welded because you just can't get to everything while it's in the jig. So we get it stuck together so that it won't move around and then it comes out of the jig and gets welded. So moving back a step in time, here is a here's a frame that just went in the jig. So none of this stuff is welded together yet. It's just tubes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you can see how everything fits in place here. And recently, we, we previously we had been drilling these all. This is a little anecdote on our how we are constantly working on making this process easier and faster. But uh, we've been drilling these in a drill press and then. The level of precision was just not where we needed it to not be, rigid enough. which meant that Jay was really fighting to make sure everything fit the way we need it to be. And a really uh, rewarding project we've done this year, it's taken us a while, but Charlie has completely rebuilt um, a Bridgeport mill, and we now have tooling that Charlie's developed that, will, that we can drill these. And Jay uh, is very happy with how quickly that goes now and how precise they are. As you can see, when that thing clips in there, it just click. We should go take a look at it. Yeah, you want to see the yeah, taking the, let's take the tube and go in there. So these are these are the tubes. This uh, is probably the hardest to produce part on the entire bike. Whenever we have people down here, that's what I tell them. Three, three bends all out of plane from each other, all different angles, and then two holes that need to be exactly exactly in the right location and then to finish it all off it's got a cope that's already cut so the cope needs to end up in the right location in the right indexed. <laughs> yep. right indexed correctly so to drill parts like these once we've got the bend correct and everything getting these holes in the right place is really a challenge so we've got the mill set up now and this kind of tubing we're using is a dom steel it's very very high quality very uh concentric round or round profile tube and so a piece of tube like this if you mess up one of these uh drilled holes that's what about 40 bucks a piece yeah the the raw material for these tubes is 40 dollars so uh it's it's about an, a dollar an inch for that tube a little more than a dollar an inch for that but so here's the uh here's the tooling we use to drill these guys so um it's a plate that has stops on it 
so I can slide it. Uh, I can slide it, put it on the mill table, and slide it up, and it registers against the T slots here. And then we clamp it down, and our tube fits in here, just like that, with an over center clamp to hold it in. And then I, I indicate off the corners to get a, a zero point, and we can move using the DRO on the mill over to where those hole locations are and drill them out. And they end up exactly the same every time, which is has been a big deal for us. It's been a lot of work. And it's been a lot of work just doing it. What, what all have you done on the, on the mill? Oh, yeah. So the, this mill we bought from, uh, from a biomedical company, Surplus, here in Indiana. And, uh, for a very of, good deal? Well, it was a... It was a stellar deal. We got a really good deal on it, which is good because I had to put a lot of work into it. We kind of thought that we were just going to clean it up a little bit and use it, but um, I started doing stuff, and as I took out a part, I said, oh, well, you know, I'm in there already. I might as well take that apart and do that. And then the next thing I knew, there were not any two bolts holding anything together. <laughs> and I, I did all the bearings, spindle bearings, uh, rebuilt a bunch of stuff on the motor, all new belts. Everything got cleaned and greased all the table and the knee came off. Um, I rebuilt the entire head, had it all down on the bench. So this mill is, is all the way freshened up ready on the inside. Ready for another 60 years, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> right, ready for another 30 years. <laughs> um, any questions at this point? People are not here. We're good. Let's go all right. So let's go back over those. That was very interesting. Those pigs. <laughs> So at this point, we've got the train welded up. Uh, the, last, the next step at this point, we, Jay will finish welding it out. And then what, what happens next? Add the uh, extra tabs, electrical paint tabs, fuel tank mounts. So those are separate fixtures? Mm -hmm. we, we call that auxiliary tooling. So this, this is our main tooling. It locates all the super important stuff. The more pieces of jig or more pieces of tooling, the more jigs you use, just the less accurate stuff is. So all the important stuff, the rake, the location of the swing arm pivot, the engine mounts are all located in the same jig. And then that stuff that is just not as critical, like the location of the electrical pan tabs or uh, your foot, foot peg brackets, where your foot pegs bolt onto. That kind of stuff can go on afterwards. And it, it saves a lot of time because you can't physically get some of those parts in here while it's in this tooling. So we'll take a frame out like this, and then there are a couple extra pieces of tooling that get used to stick other parts on. So it's all of those down there, Charles. Good example of that would be that this guy. So these, these tabs on the back here hold the air box and the oil tank on and the passenger peg. Uh, brackets and exhaust hangers. So this little piece of tooling here, oops, you can see these tabs will bolt onto there. And then this locates off of those bungs and we can get the bottom one on there too. So we have a uh, maybe four or five jigs like this that go on after the frame has come out. Um, but before final welding still. So we use our auxiliary jigs to get all the little tabs on <laughs> and then uh, they're ready for inspection. So. Here at Turtle Top, we have three stages of inspection, two stages of inspection, mm -hmm. two. Yeah, so, so um, I guess I'll dig in a yeah, little bit on the inspection. Uh, every, the next step, technically before the, the frame is inspected, or we've been doing it lately as part of the inspection process, is cleaning up all the welds. So we will wire wheel those with a uh, pneumatic wire, wire wheel, uh, and at that time we're looking for any pinholes or any, any defect in the weld. At which point we could send it back and get it, get that touched up. Um, but once the welds are cleaned up, then every chassis component has a inspection form. So this is kind of if you've watched one of our uh, videos up at the HQ, this is similar to a complete bike. So each it's fractal. Each, each component also gets its own little inspection process. So just as an example, this is a, a main frame assembly inspection uh, sheet. So it has basically a fabrication notes, an inspection checklist and notes, and an assembly team inspection. So these are the two inspections. Um, right now what we're doing, because we're, we've been only doing, we're in the 100, low 100, uh, 100s, we're having not only 
an inspection done here kind of within the fabrication process, but Ryan and Chase, so uh, our assembly, final assembly uh, guys come down and do an inspection here before it goes out to powder coat just to make sure that, that we've got a second set of eyes on it to make sure that everything's there. Because the last, we, we basically want to move any corrections as far upstream as we can make them so that they aren't coming back as a powder coated part on the build stand with maybe part of the motorcycle already built and then you realize, oh, this whole, or this cab wasn't welded on. Um, Someone just forgot it. And yeah, then, uh, the oh, end yeah. goal, <laughs> exactly, yeah, the end goal is going to be to have that down to one is internal inspection, um, but uh, we'll, make, we'll get there when we're, when we're ready. Uh, so just for example on this, um, uh, this uh, it'll be, the first it'll thing be we do is we'll, is we'll have the serial number listed and then we'll stamp that serial number into the part. So uh, this one hasn't been done yet, uh, but we've got uh, a, a transom over there, but we'll actually hand stamp in that part that, that, that number. And that doesn't necessarily coincide with the final build, but it provides a way for us to track a part internally. And so if we run into an issue with number 106 here, we know exactly who built it, any notes they made on that, any notes the inspection, the inspector made on it, et cetera. So we can track that internally and, and correct the problem as uh, fast as we can. Um, once the part is, is inspected we check off all these things sign it then this sheet will uh will go out with the the frame part ready for that second inspection from the assembly crew once that's signed off on then it can go to the next phase of the uh, process which in the case of all these parts would be straight to powder coat so um the milkman will come pick it up and it'll head out to the uh, to the amish powder coater the powder coated comes back and is ready for uh, Ryan, Jared to assemble the 450 um, full, full motorcycle. Jim Scoggins says, lifetime rider and former racer, these are real works of art. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Um, Hear that, Jay? You're an artist. Uh, Jeff asks, are 250s done the same way? I may have missed that. So uh, yes, the 250s are there's a, a similar process. It's not done by us. So that's done by our Amish fabrication shop. The welding that, raccoons. The, the welding <laughs> raccoons, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, the welding raccoons, uh, and they have their own processes and internal uh, ways of doing things that, that uh, result in the, the thousands of 250s we built. <laughs> the, the techniques for manufacturing are really the same. They're, that's how we started doing stuff old school is by having the two fifties made at the Amish shop and we kind of carried that tradition, that, that method of construction through the 450. Mm -hmm. And and maybe we can dig into that a little bit in the sense that uh, one of the reasons we wanted to go to fabrication in-house and to doing things the way we're doing it is that we wanted to uh, have the tooling be something that's that was intentional and designed. And so that's not only are we using our design software to make the bike, to design the bike and the components, but we use it to make the, the tools that make the bikes. And it's really difficult if you, like on our 250 line, they're beautiful motorcycles and they, they weld together beautifully and, and, and we're very pleased with them, but we kind of designed those on the shop floor. And so there's the tooling and then they're made by an Amish shop. So the tooling is very, very analog, so we say. Um, there's really no, documentation of that you know you know model let's say other than prints and it's so not reproducible it's not as reproducible um so one of the projects we're working on this year which we're kind of excited about and charlie can talk about a little yeah, bit sure. is some students that are helping us with the 250 line yeah so we we're actually working with um three engineering students from western michigan university scott mike and clark hi guys <laughs> Um, but they, uh, they're doing their senior project with Janus Motorcycles. So for an engineering student, chemical engineering student, your senior project is, is a big deal. That's the last thing that you do in school, pretty much, where you take on a big year-long project and you apply all the things that you learned so far in school to, to completing this project. And they reached out to us and asked if we would have any projects for them, and we do. So and I should mention that Charlie's design project was <laughs> yeah, that's right. My, my senior my senior design project was almost doing exactly the same thing to that Bridgeport 
to a different middle of school. So um, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Anyway. So the, the, the WMU guys are uh, modeling the 250 frame. So we have a CAD model of it, and they are going to be uh, designing tooling to make the 250 frame in house. So that's one of the kind of long term things that we're looking at bringing in house here. So having a way that we can do it uh, not only where it doesn't take up Richard and I's time, and uh, we get a project done that it was years away for us. Someone's doing it right now, mm -hmm. um, and they're cheap. <laughs> and doing that, that is not only to, to change you know, where we get the parts from, but it's, it's also just beneficial for us as a company to have that very accurate documentation, mm -hmm. because if you want to make changes or updates, it just makes that whole process a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so it's something we're really excited about. Yeah. Um, let's talk, should we just kind of follow the last little bit? Yeah, let's go. go. Yeah. And then so, we're going to talk about the tone. And the top so yeah, so inspections happen here. They get the, 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 the number, their, their serial number punched into them. Once the, everything's signed off, we carry them out of the actual fabrication area onto a rack out here. By the time they get out here, they have a little tag on them. Um, clipped onto the part, and that 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 little tag, along with the with the inspection sheet, stays with the part. The assembly guys at the final inspection will pick the part here. They inspect it, and if it passes their inspection, it goes to another station out uh, here on these pallets. And this is where it gets picked up and, and ready and shipped out to powder. So this is kind of, we've just witnessed the raw material coming in and the finished product going out of here. So that's the full kind of life cycle of, um, of a 450 chassis component at the at our fabrication shop. Um, Gary says, I noticed the paint booth. Are you going to start doing your own paint or powder? <laughs> we could at some point. We, I mean, that was, it's kind of a, a really nice paint booth in there. So. It came with the space. It's also a nice storage <laughs> storage bin. <laughs> and now it's a storage cabinet. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the other thing that happens down here, I'm down here five days a week, pretty much all all of my working time now, and that is because a I'm doing tooling fixes for Jay. So when when the Jay and Dennis are running into issues, I'm the guy who comes and fixes tooling or figures out an issue, but the other big reason is because now that we have our fab shop here doing prototyping, we can do prototyping in house. So I spent a lot of time down here doing prototyping. If you saw the first version of the Pillion Seed, we did a YouTube video about that where uh, Jordan followed me around for a couple days while I did the first version. And uh, I know a lot of people have been asking about it and I have the third version, the third prototype uh, about halfway done. So we can go take a look at kind of the- One, oh, one second before we do that, uh, we talked about Charlie being down here a lot more. And one of our goals as well is for both Charlie and I to be down here more, doing more research and development. Um, so right over here behind where Jay is, where, where Dennis is standing, <laughs> this area, um, this, will, this will serve as our before. Uh, <laughs> we hope we'll be a little uh, R&D area for, for Charlie and I, right off of the fabrication area. So we're looking forward to that. All right, Charlie. Yeah, let's go. So we can take a look at um, Yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Oh, yeah. I think you can just close that. So uh, I have all my computer stuff down here. So I go back and forth between um, the, the CAD program and uh, and the welder and the grinder to get stuff like this. But this is the, uh, the most recent design for the 450 pillion, 450 cargo rack. Just give it a second. We use a, we use a program called Onshape owned by PTC, but uh, there it is. There's some stuff missing out of there, out of that model, but um, going with the tube, we heard a lot of people's uh, input on the aesthetics of it. So we're going See with Richard's the input. the the, uh, the loop up top to kind of match the style of the 251 and trying to tuck this supporting rail up in higher and keep the preserve the lines of the bike. So starting from this computer model, you can see there's uh, there's this inner part right here is what I just finished up yesterday. So we'll go right over to the bench there. 
So I'm I'm going back and forth between that and laser cut part. So here's the middle part for the third prototype. Doesn't look like much because uh, it's tucked away on the inside. You're not going to really see this too much if it's installed on your bike, but um, it's an important part of the process doing that. So uh, the first couple prototypes I cut out by hand because we weren't sure where we were going, but um, now we're at the point where I'm starting to get stuff laser cut, so I don't have to cut it off all by hand, but um, doing the bending and the welding together, that's all something I'm doing. Um, we're using some stuff like a, like 3D printed tooling to set angles on, on stuff. Uh, I cut a lot of like pieces of tubing to exact correct lengths so I can bolt stuff together while it's uh, while it's being welded just to keep keep everything in its place. But um, if, you're, if you have 450 right now and you're excited about your cargo rack, it's in progress. I'm working on it <laughs> just as fast as I can. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Lots of questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> they all happened earlier, actually. So um, Jordy is curious. Uh, hey, Jordy. Oh, um, let me find it. Okay. Jordy says, when will you have the center stand ready? Also, I think you guys need to make a 250-style book rack for the 450. Um, so two questions there. Uh, so, yep. Uh, Jordy uh, just asked a question about um, this. What are we going to say? This, sorry, the center, center, stand. center stand first. When are we going to have the center stand available for the 450? And also, he thinks we should have a 250-style rear rack for the 450. And what he means by that is something that's hard mounted to the rear suspension. And our main uh, reason for going kind of a harder route with a fully suspended one is that, um, as we've explained in other videos, the the 250, it's 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 all one thing. That rear rack is connected to the entire motorcycle, so the entire bike is damping vibration. On the 450, we have full suspension, and so the rear wheel is able to move on its own. So it has very low. Uh, with the unsprung weight is very low, which means it bounces a lot more. And so anything that's put on that rack or a passenger that's put on that rack is going to be, um, what would you say? It's Charlie? like a paint shaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, uh, our, our goal with this uh, rack is for it to be to double as a cargo rack and a passenger seat. And we want it to be actually functional, not just something that looks good. Um, so that's why we're, we're, we're steering away from uh, mounting something hard to the rear wheel. You you could get away with it, but you would have to be it have to be very strong, and you would have to be careful about what you put on there. I think uh, so, several customers have yeah, made their own. Sam Rua's got some. Yeah, got yep. one he's done. And uh, I, I think they've been working good. out well. Yeah, but uh, just don't put a can of pop in there. Yeah, don't don't put cans of beer or anything on there because it, it won't make it. <laughs> um, the uh, Arthur Pendragon. Wow, he lives. Who's a Pendragon? Oh, center stand. Sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. We didn't answer this. At center stand. Center stand is in the works. Um, we've got a step. One. Cargo rack's got to be finished first, though. One project at a time. And keep in mind that Charlie is not only doing you know new project development, but he's most importantly of all <laughs> fixing and develop helping with the tooling for current production. It's a forty-hour a week job <laughs> on its own. <laughs> so that's why it takes a takes us a while. Um, so uh, Arthur the King asks, uh, could saddle bag mounts be added to the 450 luggage rack? That would get them off of the swing arm. So the we have a question that can saddle bag mounts be uh, added to the rear rack? And, and the answer is they probably can be. We're thinking about that. And um, we love, we're, we're, Charlie's design features a number of uh, places for things to be bolted on. So that'll probably be something that we'll be able to bolt on the rear rack. And that's a great idea. Great. Uh, We're looking at more questions here. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my lost interest, he hasn't lost interest though, he's been here the whole time, uh, asks, uh, <laughs> SolidWorks? Uh, oh, question about SolidWorks. Charlie, why don't you take this one? Onshape is what we use. We use a program called Onshape. So not SolidWorks, no, is the answer to that question. Uh, we use a, a program called Onshape. It's owned by PTC, so if you ever use Creo, it's the same company now. They uh, bought them, but it's a, uh, it's a collaborative uh, web-based 
CAD program. So uh, if you're familiar with Google Docs, it, I think it's like the Google Docs of CAD work. Like um, we can have a, an assembly like that, the cargo rack that you just saw me looking at, we can have an assembly like that open and both of us be working on it at the same time from our computers. And I, I see Richard's updates live to it. So uh, because Richard and I do a lot of collaboration when it comes to design stuff, uh, we work together closely on that. Anshape is really good at that. Um, and it, it's a, probably if you were to compare it with SolidWorks, it probably doesn't have all the features that SolidWorks It's has. a lot newer than SolidWorks. So, but it's a lot newer. And the, the fun thing is they just launched a bunch of new features yesterday. Every month they send you an uh, email that says, you know, here's all the new things. And it's already, since it's a browser based, it's already all there. Yeah, it just rolls in. It just rolls in. We don't so store any files on our local computers at all. Yep. Any of that stuff. It's a. Uh, so. Uh, it's a neat program. We've kind of grown with it, and we're excited about it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Um, Canadian accent? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, Gary says, where is my center stand? <laughs> I'm trying as fast as I can! <laughs> Everybody's speakers. <laughs> Uh, are you exhibiting at shows yet, like the one near Baltimore in February? Feel free to answer offline. Um, I don't know what the one in, near Baltimore yeah. is. Uh, uh, so, sorry, the question was, are we exhibiting at any shows, um, campaign shows, such as the one in Baltimore? I'm not sure what the show in Baltimore is. Um, we are, we do go to a select number of shows, um, and we'll be posting those soon. We have a small team, so we can't make it to all of the shows. Just uh, tell them about the best way to see if a bike would be to contact us if we have a different channel. Yes. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing a bike as you would at a show, get a hold of us and we can either put you in touch with somebody who can show you a bike or get you the information you want. Great. I think that's all we got. Okay. Um, so when will we get more rides like Charlie in Colorado? Oh, that's from Brent. Oh, <laughs> dang it. Doesn't count for an ass. <laughs> Well, um, oh, here's a here's another couple couple questions. Oh, Has questions. the new lithium battery been problematic, or is that a one-off okay. from a couple of the latest production? That is a very good question. So the question is: Has the new lithium uh, uh, battery had a ongoing issues with it, or was that isolated to a production a certain number of batteries? And um, the answer is: We've gotten confirmation from EarthX that there was a specific number of batteries that had. What was the actual issue? Uh, they had a. Yeah, they had to buy components during the component shortage during COVID when, ever, when electronic components were short. And as a result, they got, I think they were bad capacitors. capacitors. The, yeah. Their manufacturer was making bad parts, sold them bad parts, and they put them in batteries and sold the batteries to us. And that, that so far has has uh, hold, held true with the reports we've heard back. We haven't had as much lately. So we think it's an isolated issue. Um, as if you have any issues with your battery, let us know. EarthX is an awesome company to work with. They replace every battery. So just let us know and we can get you a, a new battery. It's a great chance to tell people that they need to tend it. That's right. And, yeah, put it on right. Yeah, now that it's winter time, <laughs> plug your battery in. Otherwise, it's not going to work in the spring. <laughs> yep. On a lithium specific tent. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Dedicated so, lithium mode. Use a smart charger. Um, but now, right now is a good time. The bike may be already put away or soon to be. Um, get it on a smart charger uh, with a dedicated lithium mode and uh, fill the tank up with ethanol free fuel and put some fuel treatment in it. Uh, great. <laughs> um, we will have a winterizing post. Yeah, that's, that's right. Actually, uh, we have a, I have a winterizing your Janus post in the hopper um, and we'll have that out soon along with a kit, a uh, winterizing kit available very soon. So stay tuned. Uh, is a 450 capable of cross country? I'm a former Harley guy. <laughs> uh, the question is: Is a 450 capable of cross country of a cross country ride? Uh, this is being asked by a Harley guy. Um, he says, uh, like a uh, red. Oh yeah, yep. The, and then there's uh, a second question. To that. So the, the 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 answer to that is absolutely. Um, the 250. I rode cross country in six days. Um, that's pretty brutal uh, ride on any bike, uh, but on a 250, the 250 is designed for. Short excursions around town, um, taking your time, um, and so it's not really a cruising bike. When we set out to design the 450, we certainly didn't want it to design it to be a big cruiser, but we did want it to be highway capable and more comfortable. So the sergeant's seat, 
the overall ergonomics, um, the power and speed uh, are gonna make that bike a bike that is absolutely something that would be a great uh, bike to take cross country. I think I'd take my time and, you know, go on back roads, but um, it's a great oh, bike. Yeah. It'd be, 90 miles an hour. It would be very happy at 80 for six hours straight. That would yeah. not be a big deal. Um, revs at 65 miles an hour on the 450. Revolutions, uh, the RPMs on a 450 engine at 60. I, th I mean, sure. I actually know this. Uh, <laughs> I think you're at like 5,200 RPM, which is right at the 62 miles an hour on the 450 is just like, it just floats. Um, and I think you're just above 5,000 RPM, which is the, the sweet spot. Uh, Paul Anderson says, as you are the motorcycle of dreamers and poets, would you be open to having famous writers, uh, writers set up a limited writers model for you? Okay, that's a long question. So, uh, somebody said, since this is the motorcycle of what poets and dreamers and yeah. dreamers, can we license that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. The motorcycle of poets and dreamers would we be open to what a writer partnering with a, a writer partnering partnering with a writer? Um, absolutely. Get a hold of us. We yeah. love. We are. We are interested in talking to more poets. And Who would be the ultimate uh, writer, philosopher, writer right? for a James motorcycle? Who would be the ultimate writer? I don't know. I like a Matthew Crawford. Yeah. Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson. I think he's already got his brand. <laughs> we'll have to think about that. If anybody in the comments has the ultimate Janice writer slash writer, uh, get in touch with us. That'd be awesome. Write your response on a two by six index card. Put it in the mail. Send it to five eleven North Fifth Street, Janus Motorcycles. Two eleven. Two eleven. Two eleven South Fifth Street. All right. Well, uh, don't do that. Paul <laughs> <laughs> Anderson says Dylan Thomas. He mm -hmm. absolutely he would have been the right one. Dylan Thomas. Paul, you got to check out our "Do Not Go Gentle" video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you like Dylan Thomas, we have a lovely video with one of our favorite customers reading uh, Do Not Go Gentle. So check it out. Uh, well, this I think concludes our first yep. live stream down here at TT. Um, and if you have any more questions, get a hold of us. We'd love to answer them. We'll probably end up doing uh, more uh, live streams down here. We'll alternate back and forth and something like that. So we're dialing all this in. Uh, we love talking to y'all. We love all the questions, so thank you all for watching, and we'll Happy catch you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, everybody. Thank, yeah, thank, Bye, Brent. Happy Thanksgiving <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Bye, Brent. <laughs>